Section 4 of American Big Game Hunting, a collection of stories by the Boone and Crockett Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 4 of American Big Game Hunting, The White Goat in His Country, by Owen Wister. Part 2 The next morning, the rain kept us from making an early start, and we did not leave camp until 8. Now and then a drizzle fell from the mist, and the banks of clouds were still driving across the higher peaks, but during the day the sun slowly got the better of them. Again we saw a solitary goat, this time far below down the ridge we had chosen. Like the sheep, these animals watched the valley. There is no use in attempting to hunt them from there. Their eyes are watchful and keen, and the chances are that if you are working up from below and see a goat on the hill, he will have been looking at you for some time. Once he is alarmed, ten minutes will be enough for him to put a good many hours of climbing between himself and you. His favorite trick is to remain stock still, watching you till you pass out of his sight behind something, and then he makes off so energetically that when you see him next he will be on some totally new mountain. But his intelligence does not seem to grasp more than the danger from below. While he is steadfastly on the alert against this, it apparently does not occur to him that anything can come down upon him. Consequently, from above you may get very near before you're noticed. The chief difficulty is the noise of falling stones your descent is almost sure to make. The character of these mountainsides is such that even with the greatest care and stepping we sent a shower rather than down from time to time. We had a viciously bad climb. We went down through tilted funnels of crag, avoiding jumping off places by crossing sides of brittle slate and shale, hailing a dead tree as an oasis. And then we lost count and T came unexpectedly on the goat, which was up and away and was shot by T before I could get a sight of him. I had been behind some twenty yards, both of us supposing we had to go considerably further. T was highly disgusted. To think of me managing such a botch as that, he said, when you've come so far. And he wanted me to tell the people that I had shot the goat myself. He really cared more than I did. This goat was also a billy, and larger than the first. We sat skinning him where he had fallen at the edge of a grove of tamarack, and T conversed about the royal family of England. He remarked that he had always rather liked that chap Lorne. I explained to him that that chap Lorne had made himself ridiculous forever at the Queen's Jubilee. Then, as T did not know, I told him how the Marquise had insisted on riding in the procession upon a horse, against which the Prince of Wales, aware of the tame extent of his horsemanship, had warned him. In the moment of the pageant, the Queen in her carriage, the crowned heads of Europe escorting her on horseback, and the whole world looking on, at this picturesque moment, Lauren fell off. I was not sure that T felt fully how inappropriate a time this was for a Marquis to tumble from his steed. I believe the queen has sent somebody in my Where, said T. To him, she probably called the nearest king and said, Frederick, Lauren's off. Go and see if he's hurt. And if he ain't hurt, hurt him, said T, completing her majesty's thought. This second billy seemed to me twice the size of a domestic goat. It was certainly twice the weight. His hide alone weighed 30 pounds, as far as one could determine by balancing it against weights that we knew such as a sack of flour or sugar. But I distrust the measurements of wild animals made by guesswork on a mountaintop during the enthusiastic state of the hunter's mind which follows at once upon a lucky shot. Therefore, I can positively vouch for this only, that all the goats which I have seen struck me as being larger and heavier animals than the goats of civilization. After all, the comparison is one into which we are misled by the name. This is an antelope, and though, through certain details of his costume, he is able to masquerade as a goat, it must be remembered that he is of a species wholly distinct. We took the web tallow and the tallow of one kidney. The web was three quarters of an inch thick. 
Neither elk nor any animal I have seen, except bear, has such quantities of fat. And I do not think even a bear has a thicker hide. On the rump it was as thick as the sole of my boot, and the masses of hair are impenetrable to anything but modern firearms. An arrow might easily stick harmless, and I am told that carnivorous animals who prey upon the deer in these mountains respectfully let the goat alone. Besides his defensive armor, he is an ugly customer in attack. He understands the use of his thin, smooth horns, and driving them securely into the belly of his enemy, jumps back and leaves him a useless, ripped open sack. Male and female have horns of much the same size, and in taking a bite out of one of either sex, as T said, a mountain lion would get only a mouthful of hair. But modern firearms have come to be appreciated by the wild animals and those which were once unquestionably dangerous to pioneers now retreat before the Winchester rifle. Only a bear with cubs to defend remains formidable. I said this to T, who told me a personal experience that tends to destroy even this last chance for the sportsman to be dotty. T came on a bear and cubs in the spring, and of course they made off, but his dog caught and held one little cub which cried out like a child and its contemptible mama hurried straight on and away. Not so a goat mama, which T also told me. Some prospectors came on a bunch of goats when the kids were young enough to be caught. One of the men captured a kid and was walking off with it when the mother took notice and charged furiously down on him. He flew by an ignominious sight of the whole camp with the goat after him, till he was obliged to drop the kid which was then escorted back to its relatives by its most competent parent. Yet no room for generalizing is here. We cannot conclude that the Ursus family fails to think blood as thick as other people do. These two incidents merely show that the race of bears is capable of producing unmaternal females, while, on the other hand, we may expect occasionally to find in a nanny goat a mother of the Gracchi. I wished to help carry the heavy hide of the second billy, but T inflicted this upon himself. Every step to camp, he insisted, for a punishment at disappointing you. The descent this day had been bad enough, taking 40 minutes for some 400 yards. But now we were two hours getting up, a large part of the way on hands and knees. I carried the two rifles in the glass, going in front to stamp some sort of trail in the sliding rocks while T panted behind me, bearing the goat hide on his back. Our next hunt was from seven till four, up and down, in the presence of noble and lonely mountains. The straight peaks which marshal round the lake of Chelan were in our view nearby, beyond the valley of the Twist, and the whole Cascade Range rose endlessly and seemed to fill the world. Except in Switzerland, I have never seen such an unbroken area of mountains and all this beauty going begging, while each year our American citizens of the East, more ignorant of their own country and less identified with its soil than any race upon earth, heard across the sea to the table de haute they know by heart. But this is wandering a long way from goats, of which this day we saw none. A gale set in after sunset. This particular afternoon had been so mellow, the sun had shone so clear from a stable sky that I had begun to believe the recent threats of winter were only threats, and that we had some open time before us still. Next morning we waked in midwinter, the flakes flying thick and furious over a front that was no longer a pasture, but a blind drift of snow. We lived in camp perfectly comfortable. Down at the forks, I had made a rough imitation of a sickly stove. All that its forger had to go on was my unprofessional and inexpert description and a lame sketch in pencil, but he succeeded so well that the hollow iron cone and joints of pipe he fitted together turned out most efficient. The sight of the apparatus packed on a horse with the panniers was whimsical, and until he saw it work, I know that T despised it. After that, it commanded his respect. All this stormy day it roared and blazed, and sent a lusty heat throughout the tent. T cleaned the two goat heads, and talked Shakespeare and Thackeray to me. He quoted Henry the Fourth, 
and regretted that Thackeray had not more developed the character of George Warrington. Warrington was the man in the book. When night came, the storm was gone. By eight the next morning, we had sighted another large, solitary billy. But he had seen us down in the park from his ridge. He had come to the edge and was evidently watching the horses. If not quick-witted, the goat is certainly wary, and the next time we saw him, he had taken himself away down the other side of the mountain, along a spine of rocks where approach was almost impossible. We watched his slow movements through the glass, and we were both reminded of a bear. He felt safe and was stepping deliberately along, often stopping, often walking up some small point and surveying the scenery. He moved in an easy, rolling fashion and turned his head importantly. Then he lay down in the sun, but saw us on our way to him and bounced off. We came to the place where he had jumped down sheer twenty feet at least. His hoof tracks were on the edge, and in the gravel below the heavy scatter he made in landing and then hasty tracks round a corner of rock and no more goat that day. I had become uneasy about the weather. It was all sunshine again, and though our first goat was irretrievably gone, we had the afternoon before us. Nevertheless, when I suggested we should spend it in taking the shoes off the horses so they might be able to walk homeward without falling in the snow, T thought it was our best plan. We wanted to find a bunch of goats now, nannies and kids, as well as billies. It had been plain that these ridges here contained very few, those all hermits, males who from age, or temperament, or disappointment in love, had retired from society, and were spending the remainder of their days in a quiet isolation, whatever is the goat equivalent for reading Horace. It was well enough to have begun with these philosophers, but I wanted new specimens. We were not too soon. A new storm had set in by next morning, and the unshod horses made their journey down the mountain a most odious descent for man and beast in the sliding snow. But down on the twisp, it was yet only autumn with no snow at all. This was a Monday, the 7th of November, and we made haste to the forks, where I stopped the night to read a large, accumulated mail, and going on at once, overtook my outfit, which had preceded me on the day before. Our new camp, and our last one, was up the Methaw, 23 miles above the forks in a straight line. Here the valley split at right angles against a tall face of mountain, and each way the stream was reduced to a brook one could cross a foot. The new valley became steep and narrow almost at once, and so continued to the divide between Columbia Water and tributaries of the Skagit. We lived comfortably in an old cabin built by prospectors. The rain filtered through the growing weeds and sand on the roof and dropped on my head in bed, but not much, and I was able to steer it off by a rubber blanket. And of course there was no glass in the windows. But to keep out wind and wet, we hung gunny sacks across those small holes, and the big stone fireplace was magnificent. By the next morning, T and I saw 300 goats on the mountain opposite where we had climbed. Just here I will risk a generalization. When a trapper tells you he has seen so many hundred head of game, he has not counted them, but he believes what he says. The goats T and I now looked at were a mile away in an airline, and they seemed numberless. The picture which the white, slightly moving dots made, like mites on the cheese, inclined one to a large estimate of them since they covered the whole side of the hill. The more we looked, the more we found. Besides the main army, there were groups, caucuses, families sitting apart over some discourse too intimate for the general public. And beyond these, single animals could be discerned, moving, grazing, browsing, lying down. Be God and be God, said T. He occasionally imitated a brogue for no hereditary reason. There's a hundred thousand goats. Let's count them, I suggested, and we took the glasses. There were thirty-five. We found we had climbed the wrong hill, and the day was too short to repair this error. Our next excursion, however, was successful. The hill where the goats were was not two miles above camp. You could have seen the animals from camp, 
but for the curve in the canyon. Yet we were four hours and a half climbing the ridge in order to put ourselves above them. It was a hard climb, entirely through snow after the first. On top, the snow came at times considerably above the knees. But the judicious tea, I have never hunted with a more careful and thorough man, was right in the route he had chosen. And after we had descended again to the edge of the snow, we looked over a rock and saw 30 yards below us the nanny and kid for which we had been aiming. I should have said earlier that the gathering of yesterday had dispersed during the night, and now little bunches of three and four goats could be seen up and down the canyon. We were on the exact ground they had occupied, and their many tracks were plain. My first shot missed, 30 yards, and as Nanny and Kid went bounding by on the hill below, I knocked her over with a more careful bullet, and T shot the kid. The little thing was not dead when we came up, and at the sight of us it gave a poor little thin bleat that turns me remorseful whenever I think of it. We had all the justifications that any code exacts. We had no fresh meat, and among goats the kid alone is edible. And I justly desired specimens of the entire family. We carried the whole kid to camp, and later its flesh was excellent. The horns of the nanny, as has been said before, are but slightly different from those of the male. They are, perhaps, more slender, as is also the total makeup of the animal. In camp, I said to T that I desired only one more of the 35 goats, a billy, and that if I secured him the next day, that should be the last. Fortune was for us. We surprised a bunch of several. They had seen me also, and I was obliged to be quick. This resulted in some shots missed, and in two, perhaps three, animals going over ledges with bullets in them, leaving safe behind the bully I wanted. His conduct is an interesting example of the goat's capacity to escape you and die uselessly out of your reach. I had seen him reel at my first shot, but he hurried around a corner and my attention was given to the others. As I went down, I heard a shot and came round the corner on T, who stood some hundred yards further along the ledge beside a goat. T had come down on him lying down. He had jumped up and ran apparently unhurt and T had shot him just as he reached the end of the ledge. Beyond was a fall into inaccessible depths. Besides T's shot, we found two of mine, one clean through from the shoulder. The goat had faced me when I fired first, to the ham, where the lead was flat against the bone. This goat was the handsomest we had, smaller than the other males, but with horns of a better shape, and with hair and beard very rich and white. Curiously enough, his lower jaw between the two front teeth had been broken a long time ago, probably from some fall. Yet this accident did not seem to have interfered with his feeding, for he was in excellent plump condition. This completely satisfied me, and I willingly decided to molest no more goats. I set neither value nor respect on numerical slaughter. One cannot expect Englishmen to care whether American big game is exterminated or not. That Americans should not care is a disgrace. The pervading spirit of the far west as to game, as to timber, as to everything that a true American should feel it is his right to use and his duty to preserve for those coming after us is, what do I care so long as it lasts my time? There remain a few observations to make, and then I have said the little that I know about goats. Their horns are not deciduous, so far at least as I could learn, and the books say this also. But I read a somewhat inaccurate account of the goats' habits in wintertime. It was stated that at that season, like mountain sheep, he descends and comes into the valleys. This does not seem to be the case. He does not depend upon grass, if indeed he needs grass at all. His food seems to be chiefly the short, almost lichen-like moss that grows on the faces and at the base of the rocks and between them in the crevices. The community of goats I watched was feeding afterward, when on the spot where they had been, I found there was no grass growing anywhere near, and signs pointed to its having been the moss and rock plants that they had been eating. 
none of the people in the Methaw County spoke of seeing goats come out of the mountains during winter. I have not sufficient data to make the assertion, but I am inclined to believe that the goat keeps consistently to the hills, whatever the season may be, and in this differs from the mountain sheep as he differs in appearance, temperament, and in all characteristics, excepting the predilection for the inclined plane, and in this habitat he is more vertical than the sheep. Lest the region I hunted in may have remained vague to eastern readers, it is as well to add that in an airline I was probably some 30 miles below the British border, and some 120 east of Puget Sound. End of section 4